Welcome to today's uh, third lecture in computational finance. Last time we stopped with uh, a small discussion of uh, the different scenarios we can encounter uh, when it uh, comes to perfect um, linear, perfect positive linear correlation, perfect negative linear correlation. And we saw that we have uh, different scenarios. One scenario is that you have perfect positive correlation, in which case you will have uh, a direct line, in other words, a convex combination of stocks A and B, or stocks 1 and 2 on this slide. Um, the next possibility is, and the next extreme scenario is, that you have perfectly negatively correlated assets, in which case you have this picture, you have stocks 1 and 2, and in fact you are able to minimize the risk of your portfolio uh, to zero and you are able to perform what we call a perfect hedge because uh, risk is reduced to zero, volatility is reduced to zero and in this case the minimum variance portfolio is on the y-axis here. Okay, So we talked about this uh, and next we saw that uh, for non-perfectly correlated assets in the two asset scenario, that is the correlation is between minus one and plus one, somewhere in between, the minimum variance portfolio is given by this equation. Again, you will need to do what? You will need to take the definition of the portfolio variance, which is very simple. As you can see, portfolio weight times uh, asset volatility 1 plus 1 minus portfolio weight times asset volatility 2 or variance 2 plus 2 times rho times x 1 minus x and the volatilities of the individual stocks. You have to form the first derivative res with respect to the portfolio weight x, set it to 0 and solve for x. Quite simple. On a sheet of paper, it's quite uh, tedious, but uh, here you can see the solution. And in fact, what we will end up with is something that looks like this. Uh, again, this is the base scenario. This is another scenario. And if we vary the correlation between 1 and minus 1, we will get something like this or this. And at some points, it will look like this triangle. Okay. Next observation, remember that in many cases, we will only look at portfolios that are above the minimum variance portfolio. It doesn't make sense to look, for example, uh, and to consider a portfolio down here, because you can see that it has the same risk as a, but B gives you a lower mean or average return. So this means these portfolios are inefficient and we will only consider the portfolios in this half. This also means that in case, for example, it looks like this, we have the minimum variance portfolio here and we will only consider portfolios on the upper half of this eggshell, what is sometimes also referred to. Okay. Now let's move to the end scenario, end security scenario. Um, we again calculate portfolio return, which is the average return on all those N assets. We have portfolio weights x1, x2, up to xn. The weights should be non-negative and they should add up to 1. This is not necessary. Again, if the portfolio weights are negative, this would mean that some or all of the assets um, are short sales. So if you allow short selling, x1, x2, x3 might be negative. If you exclude short selling, all the portfolio weights have to be non-negative. 
The portfolio return, again, is a linear combination of the returns on the individual stocks or individual securities returns. And we again get the portfolio mean return as the sum of xi times mu i. And the portfolio variance is slightly more complicated. But as you can see, you still need the basic, same basic ingredients, correlations, the crosswise and pairwise correlations, one, two, one, three, one, four, and so on, and the variances. Now this here, this sum here, it looks a little strange. It only tells you that, for example, if you have three stocks, you only have to consider one and two, one and three, and two and three, because the correlation between one and two and two and one is identical and only one is needed. So this is why uh, you have n times n minus one divided by two correlation coefficients yeah, in this sum. So this here, this will give you n times n minus one times uh, divided by two um, parts. Simple combinatorics. Now, basically, there is a possibility of naive diversification. Naive diversification simply means what? You have n securities and you invest one over n, so an nth part, into each individual asset. So if, for example, you have 1 million euros, you have 10 stocks, you would invest 100,000 euros into each stock. This is naive diversification. Why is it called naive diversification? It is diversification, but we don't have a clue where to put our money. And we don't, now, uh, we don't know and we don't understand how this works. This is naive diversification, and we want to analyze how does naive diversification play out in the end. For this, we look at the average quantities. V bar and C bar. What is V bar? V bar is simply the average individual variance. You take all variances, sigma i squared, and you take the simple average over all variances. And c bar is what? It's the average covariance. OK. And the variance of a naively diversified portfolio is what? Simply write it down. Sum i starting with 1 to n. 1 over n squared times sigma i squared, and so on and so on. And with a little rearrangement, you can see that the portfolio variance of a naively diversified portfolio with n securities is 1 over n times v bar minus c bar plus c bar. So what does it mean? It means the variance of the naively diversified portfolio is the average variance minus the average covariance divided by n, the number of stocks or securities, plus the average covariance. And the idea, of course, is to naively diversify a portfolio, one would think, OK, let's invest in two securities. If it doesn't work out, well, let's pick 10. Let's pick 100. Uh, securities. So it gets interesting in case n goes to infinity. This would be the dream of the naive diversifying investor. Yeah? If we were able to invest in all securities with no transaction costs, what would happen? Quite simple. 1 over n for n to infinity vanishes. This becomes 0. But we are still left with the average covariance. Simple result, simply by diversifying naively, by choosing a million securities and investing the same amount of money into each individual security, we are not able to diversify our risk to zero. We are still left with the average covariance as the portfolio variance. And this shows you that. Well, naive diversification works, 
but it works in a very predictable way and it's not very sensible to do so. Mm -hmm. So the average covariance still remains and we sometimes also refer to this as a systematic risk. Mm -hmm. this is, these are the systematic changes between all the different securities and it might be zero if all by chance all the covariances are zero of course we are again able to diversify and to fully hedge our portfolio but this is not really a sensible way to do so okay i've already hinted at market markowitz efficiency and let's um, uh, shortly talk about this um we are discussing um the portfolio theory of Markowitz. And as you can see, um, we have different settings in which a portfolio might dominate a different portfolio. For example, if we have mu and sigma combinations of 3, 5, 3, um, no, 3, 5, and 6, 6. This would mean the second portfolio has a higher, vol uh, the same volatility, but a higher expected return. We would always choose the second one because it gives you the same risk, but with a higher return. So second one is, uh, dominates the first one. We could also end up with a situation, for example, in which we have three and four, higher return for the second portfolio. and three and four. Higher return, but also higher risk. No domination of portfolio A to portfolio B. And this is what we mean with Markowitz efficiency. It means that given the same risk or given the same return, the other decision variable is higher or lower than uh, for the other alternative. And this means that one of the alternatives is dominated by the first one. In this case, this means this upper branch of the possibility space is dominated by all the alternatives that are on the uh, equivalent lower branch. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this here again. For example, with three securities, you can see that, for example, A and B combined, B and C combined, or A and C. And this is the combination of A, B, and C. We are able to build more portfolios now, but we only need to look at the minimum variance portfolio and everything that is up here. Because all the portfolios on the lower half are dominated by the ones that are exactly above with the same risk but with a higher expected return. So these are the portfolios uh, and this is actually synonymous with Markowitz portfolio theory. This is what we call the efficient frontier. Why is it called the efficient frontier? Because obviously you can also achieve a portfolio that is here. But then you will immediately see this one is also dominated, for example, by this portfolio. So the whole set of portfolios should actually be useless to an investor. The investor should only look at the efficient frontier, the efficienten Rand in German, of all portfolios. And this is the eggshell of Markowitz. Now, formally, the portfolios of the efficient frontier can be determined as follows. For a given constant expected return, the volatility or the variance of the portfolio is minimized. Therefore, you have the secondary condition that the portfolio return needs to be fixed, needs to be constant at R bar. All the portfolio weights needs to add up to one and the minimization of the variance can be made with the help of the Lagrange method. So this is quite simple. In practice, if we want to take this theory to uh, industry practice, 
we will see that this is not, this, not the only restriction and not the only constraint for optimization we'll have. Of course, uh, for example, if as an investor we demand a return of 5% constant, we want to minimize risk, but this is not the only constraint. Can you think of any additional constraints you might want to include in your portfolio optimization scheme? Assume you're an investor. You could also start by saying, I am willing to accept a volatility in my portfolio of, say, five. Then you want to maximize your portfolio return. What else do you need as constraints for your optimization in practice? Yeah? Maybe a little risk. Mm -hmm. This would be, you could include a value at risk constraint, but this would be an additional shortfall risk constraint. Even more practical. First of all, you need to abide by the laws of the exchange. For example, if there is no short selling, you need to input, you need to uh, include constraints on the portfolio weights. Second, second type of constraint you want to include. You don't have unlimited funds. You will probably have a budget constraint, a certain budget you can go. And then, what else? In some cases, companies have regulatory constraints. For example, insurance companies cannot invest as much money as they might want to into stocks and into equity. So you have regulatory constraints. You might have constraints that uh, originate from management, uh, from corporate governance concerns. So the efficient edge or the efficient frontier of the space of possibilities finally shows an intuitively plausible principle. Risk and return stand in a positive functional relation to each other. A higher expected return is always accompanied by a higher risk. And you start with the efficient frontier or the efficient edge of the portfolio space. And then you need to include all the constraints and you will cut down the possibility space. And it, it might be, for example, that you start with this, the efficient frontier, but for some reason, for example, you have a constraint that looks like this. And you can only consider these portfolios. Could be, because the efficient frontier at start is, only, is very theoretical in nature. We can see uh, later on we'll focus uh, more about convex and nonlinear and non-convex optimization. These are the methods we will be using to optimize our portfolio. But in fact, this is interesting to see that the same principle uh, comes into play when uh, we are looking at constraint optimization. Now, in theory, um, if you remember what you did at high school, you will probably remember a function like this. And the usual way to um, find the uh, optimum points of a real valued function uh, in one dimension is to calculate the first derivative, set it to zero, solve for the roots of the derivative, and then look at those places and uh, look at the second derivative. Now, this is a, it's actually a special case. Um, it's a special case of what we call a derivative-based optimization program or optimization um, method. And this is what is also similar in uh, the methods of steepest descent. This method works actually like uh, when you're taking a ball, letting it fall to the ground, and you simply observe into which corner the ball runs. And the same principle. You simply look at the derivative and later on in many dimensions, in high dimensions and not in one dimension, you also take uh, a derivative. In fact, it's, you take the gradient and you move your solution into the direction of the steepest descent. It's the same principle as in physics if you uh, take a ball and let it fall to the ground. This might also mean that in some cases you will fall, for example, into a local optimum. And 
it's interesting that as soon as you insert constraints, this principle no longer works. Why? For example, if, you, if, if, this, if this is function f, and if you want to maximize this function, let's say this is a function, we have 0, 1, 2. And we want to maximize f with respect to x and with a constraint that x should be larger than 1. What will happen? First of all, the local minimum suddenly becomes the global maximum of this function. We are looking only looking at the blue part. But what happens if, for example, we maximize with respect to 1.5, x larger than 1.5? This would mean we have to start here. And we are, let's say, an x smaller than 2. Then, in this case, we would only look at Okay, let me just, okay, I cannot erase this one. But in this case, we would only look at this part of the function. And you can see that in many cases, derivative-based methods for optimization will no longer work if uh, we have constraint optimization. And this also means that the um, optimum, the optimal points will lie on the edge of the solution space because the maximal point the maximum of this function between one and two with x between one and two is actually this point but this is also the, a point where uh, the first derivative is not equal to zero and here with portfolio optimization this is a classical example of constraint optimization we have the set of portfolios, and actually this is this space here. These are all the portfolios we can think of. But simply optimizing it will usually not work because we need uh, constraints. And then we'll have to resort to more, more sophisticated methods for optimization. Mm -hmm. Because we are, we'll have five, six, seven uh, constraints. Later on, we'll see that in a very practical example with real data. Mm -hmm. OK. Any questions concerning portfolio theory? I think this is quite simple. A few of you might have seen this already in introduction to finance classes. If you have no questions, then let's turn to uh, the numerical solution of linear equations. Um, you will probably have seen this in the introduction to math for economic students. You might have already seen this uh, at high school. I just want to show you that a system of linear equations, German lineares Gleichungssystem, is something you can solve on a sheet of paper, but it will take more time and it will not be as stable as some algorithms that also exist and that should be used. And in fact, linear equations occur at all points in numerical analysis. Uh, there are numerous, numerous points where you will need to solve for a system of linear equations. And in case you have to do this, um, you should use a more sophisticated algorithm. Now, a linear equation, a system of linear equation, is uh, of course equivalently written in matrix form, and it's quite simple. You have a matrix, a coefficient matrix A times a solution vector x equals a vector B, and this is the system of linear equations A11 times x1 and so on equals B1, and you have n variables and m. Uh, equations. Mm -hmm. So this is a this is a um, m times n matrix. Okay. Now 
again, solving for a system of linear equations might seem to be a little bit impractical at first because it's quite difficult to think of direct applications, but you will need this uh, if you deal with statistics and uh, more complex methods in uh, option pricing at uh, many points. Um, partial differential equations uh, in option pricing theory use this a lot and you need to solve for such an SLE. So in the first example, um, in this lecture, we also used a, an iterative procedure, quite simple one. Um, now we need, um, for this to work, we need to look at so-called matrix norms and uh, vector norms. What is, does anyone know what a norm is? A norm, mathematical norm. It, it looks quite similar to the absolute value of a number, or a real number. For example, you know that the absolute value of minus 5 is 5, and the absolute number, absolute value of 5 is also 5. A norm is actually a generalization of this concept. Um, it's a generalization because you want to use norms just like the absolute value, not just for real numbers, but also for matrices, for vectors, for any type of mathematical object. And if you generalize this in, um, in uh, calculus, um, you get something that looks like this. Usually you have three requirements for a, no for a function to be a norm. First of all, a norm is a function from a mathematical a space of mathematical objects into the real numbers. And you have three properties. First of all, the norm of anything should be larger than zero for anything but the zero object. It should be homogeneous when it comes to a scaling with the real number C. And you have a triangular uh, inequation, a Dreiecksungleichung, that means that if you have the sum of x and y, the norm of x plus y should be smaller or equal than the sum of the norm of x and y. And I can explain you this in a second. A norm is usually a distance measure. You want to measure the distance of a mathematical object to its natural zero. For example, I could define a matrix norm, I could define a, zero, a vector norm, and I could also define a norm on functions. And a norm, however it looks like, would mean that, first of all, the distance to zero for any object that is different from zero has to be larger than zero. So if I take, for example, a number zero and I compare it with five, the norm of five has to be larger than zero. Because by definition, the distance from zero to the zero object should be zero. So this is the last thing here. Then, if you scale the object by C, it should be further away from, C, from zero by a factor C. Same here. So I have 0 and 5, and if I double it, the distance should be twice as high. And the third property, the triangular inequation, is also very simple. I have two objects, 0, x is here, and y is here. Then, to go from x, uh, 0 to x and then to y, this should always be um, further away and the distance should be longer than to start at zero and go to y directly. This is why it's called a triangular inequation. Yeah? So moving from zero to five and from five to ten should be a longer distance than just to go from zero to uh, ten or at maximum the same, the sum 
of these two dis distances. Yeah? This is why it's called a triangular equation. The absolute value of a real number is a norm on the set of real numbers. It's the prime example of a norm. And here, um, a vector norm, a matrix norm, are just generalizations of this concept. So you have the zero vector, you have the zero matrix, and you want to measure the distance between any given matrix to zero, to the zero point. You know? And I hope you can understand this concept because then, of course, um, actually, um, you can also define so-called, it's not here, but in calculus, you also can easily define what we call a metric, a metric. You simply take a norm, this is how we can induce a metric. You take a norm, and for example, you have the norm of x, and you can define a, a metric by looking at the norm of the difference between two objects. Again, this is quite clear. If the norm tells you the distance between 0 and x and 0 and y, the metric will tell you the difference between x and y. Same here, if you take the absolute value, for example, 5 minus 3, the distance is 2. If you have minus 5 minus 3, you can see how this plays out. Okay. Why do we need this? We want to compare two matrices. And how do you compare two matrices or two vectors? One idea would be to compare each entry in each matrix. And this is tedious because you will end up, for example, if you simply subtract two matching matrices, you will simply end up with a matrix, for example, 1, 2, 1, 1, 0, oh, 2, 2, 5, 0. What does it tell me? Nothing. But if I have two matrices and I can define a matrix norm, I can take the metric between matrix A and B and the distance between the two, in a given mathematical sense, will be a real valued number. And then this real valued number can be interpreted as an approximation number. Because I know that if the two matrices are identical, the distance will be zero. If they are not identical, they will, the distance will be um, different from zero. And then this will be an approximation error. And you can see the vector norm, the matrix norm, they are defined in this way. And you might remember that you have seen this in the very first lecture because we talked about the condition number, sigma. Also here, you can, with, a, with a suitable norm, you are able to um, compare functions, vectors, matrices. I haven't spoken about how these norms look like. But in this general setting, you now know that you can actually compare two functions. You can compare two matrices. And this is what you do here. You have function f minus function f at x uh, bar. And you use matrix norms, vector norms, general norms to compare these two objects. So this is a vector norm, quite simple. And these are three famous examples of vector norms. The LP norms. The L1 norm, the L2 norm, or the L infinity norm. Actually, the L2 norm also has a name, it's a Euclidean. Euclidean norm. And you can easily see how they work. You have a vector of, say, three entries, a three-dimensional vector, the L1 norm is what? The L1 norm is the sum of all absolute real numbers, of all entries. The L2 norm is the square root of the sum of the squared vector entries. And the L infinity norm is simply the maximal absolute entry in the vector. And you can see that if you take, for example, a vector, one, oh no, yeah, one, two, three, what is the L1 norm of this vector? Six. 
Yeah, six. L1 is six. The L2 or the Euclidean norm is? I have to, yeah? Nine plus? Four plus one. Ah, it's 14. Yeah, sorry. Nine, ten, fifteen, yeah. Square root of 14. And the L infinity norm? Is just three. Another observation when it comes to norms. It does not make sense to compare one norm and one instance of a norm with a totally different norm. If you use one norm, you have to stick to it. And you can only compare the numbers of one given norm. But if you use this norm on many objects, on different vectors, on different matrices, you can compare these norm numbers. Yeah? You can compare the numbers. For example, if you take a vector, let's say, 3, 2, 2, you will immediately see that this one has, of course, an L1 norm of 7. And you know that with the L1 norm, this vector is further farther away from 0, from the 0 vector, than the first one. And you can compare this. If you take the difference, you know, okay, 3 minus 1, 2 minus 2, 2 minus 3, and you can see that the difference is not the zero vector. And you would have, for example, an approximation error. This is why we use norms. And again, it's almost the same as with the absolute value of real numbers. But we are, we are dealing with functions. We are dealing with vectors and matrices. So we need a generalization of the absolute value for real numbers. Hmm? Same here, quite simple in uh, MATLAB. Vector 2, 4, minus 1, 3. And the norm of norm is the standard function for a vector norm. And uh, you enter the vector v at first place. And at the second place, you tell MATLAB to calculate the first, uh, the L1, the L2, or the L infinity norm. Uh, and you can see 10. And this is the square root of uh, this uh, uh, sum of um, uh, squares, squared entries, and then the L infinity norm. OK, so again, usually we'll use this as an error term and as uh, an error measure. For matrices, the same here. Note that it's only defined for um, rectangular matrices, n times n matrices. It's again a function. And you will see that, first of all, the norm has to be non-negative for all matrices that are different from the zero matrix. It needs to be scalable uh, and homogeneous uh, when it comes to scaling and a similar triangular inequation. Okay. Here, in this case, for matrices, the usual norms look slightly different. For example, the L infinity norm is the maximum of the sum of all the matrix entries in absolute values across all rows. So you sum all the entries row-wise. The L1 norm is the same, just you don't go through all the entries by row by row, but, um, but uh, line by line. No. First one's column by column. Yeah, you sum, you sum column J1, column J2, L1 norm is row by row, i equals 1, and so on. The Frobenius norm is what looks a little bit like the L2 norm, the Euclidean norm in the case of a vector. What you do is you square all entries, you sum it all up in the whole matrix, and you take the square root. This is the L2 norm. And the L2 norm actually is uh, something different. It's the square root of rho of a transpose times a. Rho of a matrix is uh, the spectral radius of a matrix. 
And this is probably not known to all of you. Do you all know what the eigenvalue and the eigenvector of a matrix is? In fact, this I think this is done in our math class. Uh, I think our colleagues from a math department usually do this. If you have a matrix A, and you can multiply it, I think the equation looks like this. You have a vector u, and this is equal to lambda times this vector u. Um, this is what we call an eigenvector, and this real number is the corresponding eigenvalue. They have special purposes and special applications in linear algebra. And if you take a matrix, it's usually a more or less difficult task to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And they can be used in many cases uh, to get additional information on the shape of the matrix. Mm -hmm. So this is an eigenvector and an eigenvalue. This, it's not a mistranslation, uh, it's actually the, 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 the German ver word eigenvector and eigen, eigenwert and eigenvector, they have uh, uh, been inserted in the English lecture as well, uh, language as well. Okay. So this is a spectral norm and we have compatible norms, which simply means that if you have a matrix and a vector norm, they are called compatible if the following applies. The norm of A times X is smaller than or equal than the norm of A times the norm of X. Again, you have seen that matrix and vector norms are not the same. Okay. Now let's look at a system of linear equation. At first, we'll need to look at the condition number, because if the condition of the linear equation is not good, uh, we'll probably have a horrendous uh, approximation error. Now, we want to solve for x time, uh, a times x equals b, and we disturb the vector b by the term delta b. So our system of linear equations has a small input data error. The solution of the system of linear equations will also be disturbed, so that it results in a times x plus delta x equals b plus delta b. Why is the solution? Why don't we get the solution x? Quite simple. Garbage in, garbage out. We cannot expect that if we insert wrong data, we get by accident the correct result nonetheless. Very, very simple observation that might not be very intuitive. Again, for example, if you if you want to calculate 3 plus 3, you know the result is 6. But if I give you 3 and 4, you cannot expect that if you calculate correctly, if your algorithm is correct, you will get the correct answer of 6. If you are, if you are given 3 and 4, and you are asked to do a product or a sum in this case, 3 plus 4, if calculated correctly, equals 7. In this case, your correct answer that you were looking for, 6, is disturbed by 1. So you also have an output data. And this is delta x. So by disturbing b, you will probably also have a small error delta x. Uh, yeah, delta x. So put differently, if we rearrange it a little bit, a times delta x equals delta b, which means delta x equals a inverted times delta b. So the disturbance in your input data, uh, no, the, the disturbance in your, in your result, x, this is your solution, is given by the inverse of the matrix A times the initial disturbance, the initial error in your vector B. And this is interesting because you do not need, necessarily need to know what your disturbance looks like. You can see that the inverse of the matrix A governs the way and the degree to which the initial input data error is amplified by actually decreased. So with compatible matrix and vector norms, we get this following after some transformations. The norm of delta x 
divided by the norm of x. And this here is what? The initial error in your input data divided by your more or less the, the norm of your input data is the relative error, the relative starting error. The relative, no, not starting error, x is your solution. The relative error in your result, in your output, is smaller than or equal to norm of a times norm of a minus um, a inverted times the relative input error. And this here in the middle, this is sigma. This is the condition number of this matrix. So if you are given a matrix, you can calculate the condition number of this matrix by calculating norm of A times norm of the inverse of A. And this condition number tells you how much any input error will be amplified if this matrix were to be used as the coefficient matrix in this uh, system of linear equations. You don't need to know what the vector B looks like whether it's a small or a large error, if the condition number, and the condition number is only depending on the matrix A, if this condition number is 100, you know that even a slight error will be amplified by factor 100 if this matrix were to be used in a system of linear equations. And this is why, at the very beginning, I told you that condition numbers are something that are that are irrespective of algorithms and you don't care about the magnitude of your initial error. If you use this matrix A and it has a condition number of 100, any error will be amplified by factor 100. And you can choose and change algorithms as much as you like. With this matrix, you will never get a good result. And this is why in one of the first examples I showed you um, the uh, how was it called? Not the Frobenius matrix. Uh, was the I don't remember this uh, very special matrix uh, that has a special um, structure, and it's famous or rather infamous for having a very large condition number. Mm -hmm. Okay, Hilbert matrix. It's a Hilbert matrix. So this is the condition number of the matrix A. It gives the condition of the solution of a system of linear equations with coefficient matrix A. And of course, this is equivalent to the problem of calculating the inverse matrix of A. And the higher the condition number sigma, the more the solution of the SLE is skewed and disturbed by the error in B. To see this, Let's consider the following matrix, 1, 0 0.6, 0 0.3, and so on, and so on. And you can simply insert it, this in mat, uh, MATLAB and calculate the condition number by taking count of A. In this case, for A, the condition number is almost 30. If you take the Hilbert matrix, it's still a 3 times 3 matrix. So this is extremely simple when it comes to calculating the uh, system of linear equations and solving for the system of linear equations on a sheet of paper, this is a condition number of 530. And every small error will be amplified 500 times if you use this structure of a matrix. Yeah? So no big surprise that, that the computer will um, give you problems and make you problems. Now. To talk a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about two uh, methods for solving such a system. Um, I think I'll talk. I'll just talk about the uh, direct algorithm here, which is Gaussian elimination. You've seen this at high school. This is what you do on a sheet of paper. In fact, Gaussian elimination can be can be uh, improved upon a little bit by looking at it in a matrix uh, notation. Now, you take the matrix A, you use a permutation matrix, P, you calculate P times A, 
and you try to find what we call an LU decomposition, no? or also LR decomposition. German the same, in German the same, LR zerlegung, LU zerlegung of a matrix. This simply means that you have a um, lower triangle and an upper triangle matrix, L and U, and you can change A to such a form that it is the product of a lower and an upper triangle matrix. If you invert a matrix on a sheet of paper or solve for the system, you know it's basically the same. You try to get a form in which you have uh, a triangle and then you reverse engineer more or less uh, the other solutions. You know, for example, xn is 5, then you insert xn into the um, uh, second last uh, equation and so on. And it's the same here. Uh, in matrix notation it's P times A has to equal L times U. You try to get an L U decomposition. It's quite simple in MATLAB. Here for example with this matrix 1, 4, minus 2, minus 3, 9, 8, 5, 1, minus 6. L U of A gives you L, U and P. You will get the lower triangle matrix, the upper triangle matrix U, and the permutation matrix P, so that P times A equals L times U. The permutation is what you might remember um, if you solve for this on a sheet of paper. You sometimes switch columns. You can always switch rows, but if you switch columns, you have to remember this. And the permutation matrix is just for doing that. No? Okay. It reduces the number of necessary op operations. And you can also take this. You can also do LU for this matrix. And in fact, if you want to see how um, accurate MATLAB is, you simply need to calculate L times U minus A should give you not a norm. We now know that one should use a norm, a matrix norm for this. But if you take the difference between L times U minus A, you can see that actually all the entries are zero except two entries. And these are close to zero with 15 decimal points precision. Yeah, so this is 0 0.00000 and at 15th place there is minus 0 0.4441. So quite accurate, but again, remember, this computer is only able to calculate uh, precise numbers up to uh, starting at the 16th or 15th decimal point. So one notices that the equation P times A equals L times U is not exactly satisfied. And we can see that the permutation matrix is often used to reduce this error even a little bit. In this case, actually, it does not help. Uh, but there might be cases where this will help MATLAB. Um, and here, there is no apparent um, effect. Now, we only have an LU decomposition. But this does not solve uh, the system of linear equations. Actually, if you have the LU decomposition, it's simple. A times x equals b is L times Y equals P times B, and then you have to solve for U times X equals Y. And you can do this in MATLAB. MATLAB uses Gaussian elimination in this operator. A slash B uses Gaussian elimination to solve the system of linear equations with A as coefficient matrix and B as a vector. And this is the solution here, x1, x2, x3. OK, quite simple. You can also do the same by hand. u slash l slash p times b gives you the same result. Yeah, And at the chosen number of digits with four decimal points, we get the same result might be that um, it is slightly more accurate after 16 decimal points. Now, um, what is the advantage of solving for a system of linear equations by the LU decomposition? Again, remember, 
This is now the LU decomposition. Gaussian elim elimination is uh, actually what you do on a sheet of paper. And for, to, uh, for this to analyze, we generate um, 100 times, actually 1,000, 100 times 100 matrices. A is rand, 100, 100 is a random matrix with random entries, random numbers. And what I do now is we have one matrix A and we start, tick, talk. This is in MATLAB the start and stop of the timer. And in this for loop, we say for i equal to 1 up to 1000, we generate a random vector b and we solve x equals a slash b. This is Gaussian elimination, what you would do on a sheet of paper. Simply going through row by row and doing um, basic uh, column operations. For 1000 random systems of linear equations, we need one second, very fast. We do the same with the LU decomposition. Tick, we do one LU composition, and then we do the same by hand, U slash L slash P times B, and the elapsed time is 0 0.09 seconds. So what you've learned at high school, what you would do now on a sheet of paper, Gaussian elimination, is actually 100 times slower than LU decomposition. They both give virtually the same result and still 0.01 second or 9 second versus 1 second is no big difference. But in industrial applications, when you have horrendous, huge matrices, huge optimizations, and you need to solve for these types of systems of linear equations, a factor 100 when it comes to speed is quite essential. So this is my, my, my prime example of a method that works, that you've already known from high school, that you can apply right now, but you should not use it. Because the computer, when it used in a computer, uh, a decomposition of um, the matrix into LU uh, matrices is much, much faster. This is a direct method. And this is usually, if you have no rounding errors, this is exact. And this next step, these are iterative solutions. And as this is a very late time on the day, I would say we stop here and we'll continue tomorrow in the morning. Iterative methods take, take a different approach. They start with a solution and they try to improve on this solution in every step. We've seen this with the Newton iteration to find the, res the zero on the root of a function. And here we try to find uh, better and better solutions. Actually, these, matrix, uh, these methods uh, are especially helpful when it comes to sparse matrices. Do you know what a sparse matrix is? Sparsam besetzte, spärlich besetzte. These are matrices that look like this. If you were to do this naively with Gaussian elimination, you would calculate yourself up until the end of time by calculating 0 times 0 times 0 plus 0 times 0 equals 0. The computer does not distinguish between 0 and non-zeros. So it will perform all these computations. The iterative methods should drive the second or third delusion, uh, solution into the vicinity of the final result quite quickly. And you will need not as many iterations as with a matrix that is full with non-zeros. So, so these methods are usually used from matrices that are sparse. And in many applications, we will see these matrices, even when it comes to uh, financial applications. Mm -hmm. So this is what we'll look at tomorrow.
Do you have any questions? If you have no questions, thank you for your attention and have a nice evening. Thank you. <laughs>